You're watching Sky News Money. Day continues with Switzer. Hello, I'm Peter Switzer. Welcome to the program which puts you in touch with the best and brightest minds in the business on tonight's show. Let's try and work out why the stock market of ours keeps trading sideways with fund manager Roger Montgomery. AMP Capital Shane Oliver will explain the disappointing retail numbers today and whether the household debt to GDP ratio is a ticking debt bomb. Prime Values ST1 will share with us the stocks he likes and why and we'll look at a very successful family business called scenic world based in the blue mountains of new south wales stay with us for the next hour we'll bring you all the latest corporate news and market analysis plus learn some valuable lessons from australian success stories if you have any questions for me or our guests email them to switzer at switzer.com.au you can follow me on twitter the handle is at peter switzer now roger montgomery of montgomery investment management has not exuded positivity for when it comes to the overall stock market for some time. But has he seen any positive light at the end of the tunnel? Or maybe he thinks we'll keep trading sideways or maybe something worse. Let's find out with Roger right now. Thanks for joining us, Roger. Always a pleasure to be with you, Peter. Let's start big picture first. I know the big picture doesn't really concern you that much because you like to go after individual companies. But what's your feeling? Uh, you might have heard me in the intro, I said that you haven't been all that positive on stocks for quite some time and we've traded yeah. sideways. What, what, what's the, the tunnel showing you? Positivity or negativity? Well, cautious, very, very cautious optimism, in, in fact, increasingly cautious. Mm. Um, with respect to the question about why the stock market's traded sideways, it might surprise you to know it's actually unchanged for about the last decade. Um, my theory on that is fairly simple, 40% or about 50%, almost 50% of the market is dominated by you know, really 15 companies um, and the majority of those companies have paid the bulk of their earnings out as a dividend uh, over the last decade. Now when, even if you're generating a very high rate of return on equity, if you're re not retaining a large proportion of that profit and reinvesting it for growth, then guess what, your earnings don't grow. Perhaps the best example of that is Telstra, which since Sol Trujillo was around in 2005, um, has paid on average about 98% of its earnings out as a dividend. The upshot of that is its earnings haven't grown. In fact, its profits this year will be not much higher than they were in 1999. And if you have a look at their uh, dividends, well, of course, their dividends are going to follow the earnings they really haven't grown either and so the share price in the long run follows the income growth of a company and if that income growth isn't growing then neither will its share price. Companies like Telstra um, are driving the index uh, and because they've got such a large weight in the index and that's why the index hasn't gone anywhere. Mm. It's interesting that you say that and I've, I've always known that's one of your, your strongest arguments against certain companies in particular. But this uh, reporting season, Harvey Norman uh, came up with a record profit. They mm -hmm. cut their dividend and they retained more profit. I, I, even though Jerry said it's not to fight Amazon, uh, the bottom line is the stock market didn't like them doing it. W was he unfairly treated? Yeah, well, to, to a certain extent, yes. There's, there's obviously some doubt about the accounting um, of the company and there's also potentially a belief that the retention of profits was not for growth. Uh, but it was in fact to, um, to support uh, franchisees. So, so that's a particular example where you know, the retention of profit, which may not be used for growth, um, isn't rewarded. So um, Peter, the, the big story though, I think is market valuations broadly, which are definitely stretched, not only in Australia, but also in the United States. And uh, yesterday, oh sorry, last week, um, an essay was published by Robert Schiller, the professor who came up with the, the cyclically adjusted PE ratio, or the Cape-Schiller PE ratio. Um, and he made some interesting observations in that essay. Firstly, he noted that the PE ratio, or his PE ratio, is now over 30, um, which many analysts are saying is neither here nor there because earnings growth is very strong. Um, but what he did was he actually took the media's definition of a bear market, which is a 20% decline, went back and had a look where the media actually got that from and he couldn't find any attribution for it. But nevertheless, he said, OK, well, let's, let's take a 20% decline in the market, but we need to define a time frame. Uh, and what he said was he'll, he'll take the peak, 
the highest point in the previous 12 months and look for a 20% decline. And what he noted was since 1871, there were 13 declines or 13 bear markets. So 13 episodes of 20% declines within 12 months from a previous peak. And what was interesting is going back all the way to 1871, the average Cape Schiller PE ratio was about 16.8. Uh, so that contrasts with 30 times. Um, and then what he noted was that in every instance of a bear market uh, that he counted, and there were 13 of them, the PE ratio was high um, and it was well above the average. And analysts today are saying, well, earnings growth is very strong, so that perhaps justifies the high PE. But what he noted that in, on each of the bear markets, in each of the bear markets, the, um, the earnings growth was also very high um, and um, well above average uh, in each of those instances. <laughs> and then many analysts are saying, well, we've also got very low volatility at the moment because earnings are stable and the likelihood of sharp rises in interest rates is low. And what he noted is, is in each of the 13 cases of bear markets, we also had very, very low volatility just before the correction. And in fact, he pointed out that in 1929, um, the volatility was even lower than it is today. Uh, and so, so he said, in conclusion, he said in this essay that he wrote just last week that, um, that the conditions today are precisely the same as we saw on each of those 13 bear market occasions. Now, I don't know whether that means the stock market is, uh, is due for an imminent correction or not, but I certainly think that it, it makes sense given that our models are telling us it's appropriate to have large amounts of cash. <clears throat> Roger, the only thing you left out of that analysis, which makes me you know, ponder its relevance now, is in none of those bear markets you referred to were interest rates so low. Yeah, that's true. In fact, interest rates, the 10-year Treasury interest rate um, in June last year hit 1.36%, mm. which was in fact lower than any time since Captain Cook crossed the Antarctic <laughs> Circle. In fact, it was lower than during the, um, the Great Depression. You might remember, uh, well, we weren't there, but <laughs> during the Great Depression, uh, US unemployment was at sort of 20 to 25 percent. We had nothing like that last year. Now, rates have bounced since then. Um, they're up at US 10-year treasuries are now 2.33 percent, up from 1.36 percent in June last year. Um, but you know what, Peter, it tells, you know, it, it, it points to another thing. If, if interest rates aren't justifiably low because of economics, then they're put there synthetically and artificially, and that's just not sustainable. So interest rates could go up. And in fact, the bounce in bond rates we've seen hasn't had any effect on, uh, on central bank policy. In fact, you know, it's interesting that central banks have allowed rates in US 10-year treasuries to bounce so firmly. All right, so uh, how much cash are you holding now? So in our private fund, we're holding about 47% cash. Uh, in, our, uh, in our Montgomery fund, we're holding about 27%. Uh, in our global fund, about 23%. So these are close to record levels of cash that we're holding. And our model's telling us um, we can't find high-quality businesses or many high-quality businesses that are cheap. We can find a few and we own them. Um, but we're not finding many new ones, and that means that the next best place to have your money is cash. Yeah. Now, if you were really worried, like you've, you've, you've produced a case to be cautious mm. about what's happening, but if you were really worried, would your cash levels be a lot higher? Well, in the private fund, we can hold up to 100% cash. Mm. So if we found absolutely nothing that was cheap and everything that we owned was ridiculously expensive, then we, our cash levels would go even higher than they are today. But, you know, there are opportunities. So, for example, um, REA, uh, on, on one valuation scenario, we've got a valuation of $80 um, for REA, and it's trading below that. So there's still some value in the market. Yeah, OK. So let, let's just focus on some stocks. You've obviously gone for REA. Is there any new one that's come on your, um, on your radar screen that you like? Yeah, so um, uh, in the last few months, since I, well, since I last saw you, Peter, um, a couple of companies did pop up, uh, Speedcast and Steadfast, um, the, satellite, uh, the satellite company and, uh, which provides satellite communications to cruise ships uh, and the insurer, the general insurer, small general insurance broking network in Australia, 
both of those companies uh, have grown spectacularly well and um, we bought them admittedly at lower prices than they are today but they still don't look uh, ridiculously expensive and in fact um, they're in our sort of top 10 holdings for the Montgomery Fund. Um, back to REA just for a second Peter, you know many people don't realise that its, its profits aren't rate related to property prices but related to two things, the number of listings and the period of time that those houses will be listed. Um, and we're starting to see an uptick in listings which is a big turnaround because in the last five years listings have declined by about 21% nationwide mm. uh, and now we're seeing those listings uh, pick up again. Do you think this co coincides with the thoughts that in Sydney and Melbourne the market probably has hit the top and therefore those who want to try and materialise their, their capital gain will probably be trying in this spring or probably... Yeah, I think yeah. I think that's right. I think that's absolutely right. It makes perfect sense. People are going to try and capture the price that their neighbours received a few months ago. So they're going to list their property. But as more properties are listed, the buyers pull back because they've got more choice. And so it takes a little bit longer to sell. Now, an add-on REA in domain might go for 30 to 45 days. Um, and uh, if you don't sell your property in that time, well, guess what? You have to advertise again. Um, so that's more revenue, more listings and a longer listings which is better for the profits of REA. We're also seeing an, uh, an uptick in the number of premier ads on REA's website. So people paying more for the expensive ads uh, to try and feature their property. So that's growth on growth on growth uh, for a company like REA and, and it's still below our estimate of value. That's pretty hard to find in this market. Okay, just quickly talk to us about what you like about Steadfast. Yeah, so in both cases we've got businesses, Steadfast and Speedcast, in both cases we've got businesses that have relatively modest levels of debt, high rates of return on equity and good growth. Um, if, we look at, uh, if we look at Speedcast for example, um, many analysts believe that its, it's profits are tied to, um, tied to merchant shipping which is not going well. But in fact its profits are tied to cruise lines and cruise shipping um, and they're growing phenomenally because mm. of the demographic um, boom. We're seeing baby boomers retire in ever larger numbers and as a result of that we're, uh, we're seeing more of them cruise around the world and so you're seeing ever larger ships being constructed and, uh, and uh, being launched uh, and that's good for business. Okay mate, well we are out of time. Thanks for joining us and good luck. See you again Peter. Roger Montgomery from Montgomery Investment Management coming up after break. We'll look at the data Dell used this week um, with Shane Oliver from AMP Capital and we'll try and work out what's going on, particularly with those retail numbers.